Hi everyone, I hope everyone's uh, feeling okay. Welcome to the morning after the first night being away from home for a while. Um, so my name is Paul uh, Fifield. I'm the CEO uh, and co-founder of Sales Impact Academy. So we're a live uh, learning and development platform uh, for go-to-market teams, sales and go-to-market teams. Uh, and we support the development of typically uh, teams at fast growth tech companies. One of our uh, investors, amazing investors, is Stage 2 Capital, um, founded by Mark Roberge uh, and a guy called Jay Poe. Uh, and I'm really thrilled to be introducing uh, Mark today. Uh, he is the former CRO of HubSpot. Uh, he wrote probably I don't want to embarrass you, Mark. One of the best books on sales I've ever read called The Sales Acceleration Formula. If you haven't, haven't read it, I'd suggest absolutely reading it. It changed the game for me as a CRO. Uh, Mark's also a, a professor at Harvard Business School, uh, teaching all things go to market. And as I said, he's also co-founded Stage 2 Capital, which is an incredible incredible venture firm. All of the LPs, 300 LPs, it's a very interesting model. Uh, basically 300 of the most elite go-to-market leaders in the world, and they're the ones that have basically created the, the fund. So, without further ado, as they say, Mark, over to you. Thanks, Paul. I'm going to bring you around with me. All right, so uh, thanks for coming out, folks. It's a couple of years ago, um, a company that was doing around 30 billion in revenue, software company, uh, they were bringing a new product to market and it was kind of mission critical for them and I, I was brought in to help them to make sure the strategy is right. And they told me, you know, we've heard that this fails like 50% of the time. And I said, I, don't I think you're right, maybe even underestimate. So I'm like, let's take a look at your sales strategy on how you're going to bring this new product to market. So they showed me this huge plan. They were going to launch it in three months. They had all the product roadmap stuff done. All the engineers were lining up with the features. They were going to kick this off at the conference. The CEO had the slides ready to go to talk about it. Marketing had built those things. Marketing had pulled together the whole new website launch to support the new product offering. They were training the sales team. They had this whole training initiative to train their 5,000 salespeople on the new product so they could go pitch it. They had the support training going on for the whole support staff. So if someone called a, a problem, they could know what to do. And they were like, what do you think? And I said... I think you just increased your failure rate to 80%. And they're like, what are you talking about? We, we spent like a year putting this super detailed, I was like, it's impressive. And they're like, well, what, what's the issue? And I was like, I think I can sum it up as you're scaling while you're learning. And that's why I think you're gonna fail. And you've probably all been through product launches and. I don't know what your success rate is on them on the first pass, but I think that's the kind of the underlying failure point of where we go wrong on these. And this applies to going into a new market. I know some of you are doing that, et cetera, is we just assume we can get it right out of the gate and we try to scale while you learn. And so um, that's what I want to talk about. I'm going to introduce a couple of frameworks to you. And like I said, this doesn't just, you know, here's how I think about like, expansion of your addressable market and your revenue potential is you're in a particular market with a product and a go-to-market channel. And as you try to grow, you can either introduce a new product or go into a new market, like I know I talked to some of you before, or you can try to sell through a new channel. And these are all ways for you to expand your growth potential. And this particular framework applies to all three of those. I think we get cocky about our ability to do something new right out of the gate. And I, I don't know, are any of you in like a, a startup that's like sub 10 million, okay? It's, it's kind of like the equivalent of you back in the day when you were two people with a business plan and idea and you walk into an investor and you're like, yeah, I've got this idea. I'm like, great, what are you gonna do in the next quarter? We're gonna hire 50 salespeople and start selling it. Like we don't do, we used to do that in the 90s when we did entrepreneurship, but thanks to like lean startup and all this stuff, we don't do that anymore. 
So why do we think when we're this big multi-billion dollar company that we're gonna come up with an idea that works for the first time and it's just gonna go? And so like on the sales side, one of the kind of like underlying pieces, is, let's just think about this for a sec. You probably will get it wrong. You probably will get the product slightly wrong. You probably will get the message slightly wrong. And when you go out and train your 500, per, you know, 500 salespeople on it, and they're gonna spend 30% of their time selling a message in a product that's slightly wrong, you've just decreased the productivity of your sales team by 30% and distracted them. Furthermore, all those opportunities and all those sales calls are opportunities to learn. And you've spread all those opportunities to learn across 500 brains. They're not gonna see the patterns. Imagine if instead you had just chosen 10 people, 10 people to do all the new product pitches. Now they're gonna see the patterns and you put them in the room every day to talk about those patterns. You keep your sales team focused on what you know and scale and you isolate a team to learn the new stuff and adapt, okay? And so the first framework I'm going to introduce to you that I thought was brilliant is done by a peer of mine at Harvard named Michael Tushman called the Ampidextrous Organization. I don't think it's as well known as it should be. And it's funny that um, I read this framework for the first time in 2016 and I was shocked because we had successfully launched a new product critical to HubSpot's success in 2013 and followed every step of his framework before I even knew about it. And I, I just love it when I see very broad reaching frameworks that I look back and I'm like, holy cow, that like fits all like the example success stories that I saw along this. And so let's talk about this for a second. It has three pieces to it that we're gonna kinda um, pull apart using HubSpot as an example. Okay, and these are the three principles around it. Okay, so let me take you back to like 2012 and HubSpot. We were, um, so if you don't know HubSpot, we're, um, we, we were originally a marketing software company. And um, in 2012, Salesforce.com, does anyone here work at Salesforce? Okay, I love Salesforce, but I, I like they bought one of our competitors and um, they started selling the product for a dollar a year. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. Because we sold our product for maybe 10,000 a year. That's tough. That's a tough battle, right? But smart, smart. And so we're like, all right, this is do or die. Um, at the time, I think we had like 100, 200 million in revenue. We had like 1,000 employees. And we're like, we, ha we're, we're supposed to go public in 18 months. We have to go into the CRM space to survive. Because Salesforce is offering the whole go-to-market suite. And we're going to get creamed. So we have to launch a CRM. And so... Let's kind of use that challenge with this particular framework, okay? So first off, um, if you went to our website at the time, this is what it looked like. Create marketing that people love. So if I'm telling a VP of sales to buy my CRM and they go to this website, I'm not that psyched about that. And that's what um, Tushman says about like creating an overarching strategy is if you're serious about launching a new product, then you have to reinvent your messaging and brand and positioning to encompass the new, but also embrace the old. Because sometimes we go in one of two directions. Either we are a wimp about it and we don't lean in and don't change our website and we don't set ourselves up for success. No VP of sales is going to buy a CRM from this company. Or we go so far that we change the website to like, our new CRM, look at us, hey, VP of sales, and all the existing marketing customers are like, what the heck? Right? And so to his point, I think the famous example that Tushman says is if railroad companies in the 1950s had defined themselves as transportation companies, they probably would have been disrupted by the airline industry. 
That's how we have to think about it. So we leaned in and came up with growth. And to this day, HubSpot is very much about, it used to be all about inbound marketing. And at that point, it was just about growth. And that checked Tushman's box and worked really well. The second one was embrace, hold tension at the top. So typically when I see these product launches happen, it is owned by a product manager who's in charge of this new product. And they report to the director of product management in that region who reports to the VP of product marketing in that region who reports to the chief product officer who reports to the CEO. That's how it's done. But we all know that like, if we're serious about bringing this mission critical product to market, they're gonna need the core business's help. But the core business is focused on what they know and how to drive revenue and they're not gonna give it to them. So someone needs to be in charge of putting out that tension. And most companies who assigned it to that product manager that's five, six levels down in the organization, they don't have the political power to do that. And so Tushman says, hold tension at the top. Don't think about your company structure, org structure based on p and size. Think about it based on strategic value. And so he claims, even though this, the core business is doing $20 billion and this new product isn't even doing 100 million, even in doing, not even doing a million, they need to report really high up in the organization. And that's what we did. We didn't bury it. This is what HubSpot's sales uh, whole company looked like before we introduced the CRM. Everybody was focused on the marketing product. And then when we launched the CRM, we stuffed the whole marketing business under the COO. And the person running the CRM reported to the CEO. $200 million in revenue, zero, but huge strategic value. And now the CEO took ownership on the tension that came up. Well, I need this to launch the CRM. Core business is like, we'll never hit our number if we do that. CEO makes the decision, sometimes in favor of the core business, sometimes in favor of the new, but that's their call. Okay, the last and final piece, and this is, I know there's probably uh, 15 or so hands went up around our early stage startups. I think what I've done, what we've talked about so far, you do well, you're kind of forced to. This part, I think even the early stage startups mess up. I was, um, over the last five years, when I, uh, after the HubSpot IPO, I, as Paul had mentioned, I left and joined the faculty at Harvard full time and worked with lots of startups served as an independent board member, places like Asana and Drift and companies that became unicorns, worked with them when they had no revenue. So I got to study all these companies that were bringing products to market, and I started to see patterns on why they fail. And really, the patterns came down to when they chose to scale and how fast. And so I want to talk about this at this moment. So what Tushman says here is the last piece is, Embrace inconsistency. And what he says is the core business is measured by the P&L, the revenue and the profits. Most people, when they launch a new product, even an entrepreneur, the first goal they set is revenue. I actually could not disagree more with that strategy. And I want to kind of bring that to life for you on why I think that's not right. And I've seen that contribute to unnecessary failure with every product launch, including the entrepreneur ecosystem. So Tushman says, measure the core business by the P&L, measure the emerging business by the pace by which they're learning. Okay, so let's talk about that. So like I said, I find that most product launches and most early stage ventures fail unnecessarily because of kindergarten mistakes on choosing when to scale and how fast. And so think about like when, when do you think you're ready to scale? 
half the, half the entrepreneurs I ask that question to say, I think we're ready to scale when we have, you, you know, uh, 100,000 in revenue, when we have 20 customers. And I, I think that's market message fit. That just means you know how to sell. Doesn't mean the product works. I can sell ice to Eskimos. Doesn't mean they need it. Right? So that has nothing to do with whether you're willing to scale. The other half of the entrepreneurs will say, we're ready to scale when you have product market fit. I talked to a couple of you before today, uh, before this, uh, this time, and you said that, product market fit. Now, what's interesting about that is if you ask 100 entrepreneurs what is product market fit, you get 100 different answers. I mean, what do you think product market fit is? That's crazy that, like, again, thanks to the work of Eric Reese and Lean Startup and Steve Blank in the early part of this century, great. We don't sell vaporware anymore. We try to get product market fit first. But what is it? It's not a revenue line. If you look at the um, Wikipedia page for product market fit, you have amazing entrepreneurs talking about you just, it's a feeling you just get. There's a pull in the market. You just know it when you have it. Really? That's what we're going to base one of the most critical strategic decisions in our business is on a feeling? I don't know. Like, I did my business school work at MIT, and I'm a very quant-oriented person. I just can't, I can't get behind that. Now, the best definition I've seen out there is a guy named Sean Ellis up in the Valley. Growth Hackers is his original business. And he says, you have product market fit when you survey your customers and you ask them, how disappointed would you be if your product didn't exist? And if 40% say, very disappointed, then you have product market fit. I like that. That is so much better. So much better than a million in revenue or a feeling. It's data-driven, and it's based on the customer value, their perception of value. My only issue is it's a survey. I just, I think surveys are riddled with false positive. I mean, you've taken these surveys with your friends, like, hey, do you like my product? Of course I love your product. It's their baby. You're not always truthful. And again, I'm a little worried about that. So for me, if I had to choose a metric, I would choose retention. Or if you're not in a subscription business, I would choose the fact that they, re they buy something else from you. If you sell clothes, they buy something else. If you sell books, they buy another one. Because they used your product and they decided to buy it again. So I'm going to use retention to summarize that, but I if you're not in a subscription business, I mean like buy more stuff from you. That, I like that metric. The only issue with that is it takes a long time for you to know what your retention is. And if we're early, in the early sequences of bringing a product market, whether we're an early stage entrepreneur or we're a multi-billion dollar company, I don't have a year to know. I need to know in like a month. So the key within this model is to come up with a leading indicator to retention. What is the leading indicator of your customer attention? What is it that you could see in the first month of a customer's life cycle with you that if that happens, they're gonna be with you forever? And if it doesn't, they're going to churn. What is it? Think about that for your product. What, what is it that you could see in the first month if it happens, 90% of them will be with you forever. If it doesn't, 90% of them will churn. Let me bring that to life a little more and give you a framework around it. So P% percent of customers do E event and T time. Okay, so now we've isolated our leading indicator attention to three variables, P, E, and T. I used to code in the early part of my career, so some of that comes out here. If you're a coder, you might respond to this type of thing. Let's bring it to life, Slack. If 70% of customers send 2,000 team messages in the first 30 days, we have product market fit. I love that. And that's kind of what it was there, if you read about them. I love that. Imagine if the founder of Slack stood up in front of the company when there were 10 people and said, 
our first goal is a million in revenue. That's what a lot of entrepreneurs do. Versus our first goal is to get 70% of our customers to send 2,000 team messages in the first 30 days or every 30 days. Those are two very different companies that come out of that. I will invest all day in the latter. The former, maybe. And that's what a lot of VCs ask, right? A lot of VCs just ask you how fast you're growing. If you're growing over 200%, I'm in. If you're not, I'm out. I think that's blatantly wrong. I ask, like, show me these numbers. If these are happening, I'm in. If you're going 200% a year revenue and this is a mess, your churn is 50%, no one's using your product, I don't want to fix that. You don't have a company. If you have this and you just can't sell, we can fix that. That's easy. That's the next step. Well, it's not easy, but it's, that's the next step. Let's go. That's a great foundation of a business. And we've destroyed amazing, I mean, I don't know if anyone worked at Groupon, but I kind of feel like uh, we went public and never figured this out. All right, so Dropbox, you know, 85% of your customers back up their device every day. HubSpot, you know, we caught this one late because we were pretty early in the SaaS journey. We didn't really know how important retention was. If 80% of customers use five or more features in the platform every two months, that's what predicted retention. It's really powerful when you, this becomes your North Star and the product people, the engineers, the customer success people, the sales people are aligned with this. In fact, like, let's just talk about sales for a second. I mean, almost all the customer attention issues I see out there, if, you have a, if your customer attention is not quite where you want it to be, most people look first to the product and second to the customer onboarding team. And I think the issues rarely are in there. Like, let's think about it. If you have 50% churn and 50% customer retention, that's really bad. But half of your customers are succeeding. So if all you did was sign up people just like that, you'll have 100%. Customer retention issues are mostly sales issues. It's the customers that your salespeople, you're like the VP of product, just punched the VP of sales in the back, by the way. There. Um, the... the um, <clears throat> The issue is because of the, the customers that your salespeople choose to sell and the expectations that they set. Like we have amazing like sales qualifying matrices out there like BANT, budget, authority, need, timing. What's the BANT? What's the BANT? It tells us how they're going to buy, whether they'll buy. Do you have the sister of that, which is whether they'll succeed? Did the salespeople check off the stuff necessary for the customer to succeed? Classic example in like a technical setting is did they get the CTO on board before they sold the product? The business unit head loves the product. It's going to help them solve everything, but there's a month's worth of implementation work that needs to happen that the CTO needs to do. The salesperson doesn't need to do that to get the deal. But if they don't do it, there's no way the CTO is setting that up. But if they get the CTO involved before the sale, that product's going to succeed. That's just one of many examples. So a classic, you know, if we're just compensating our salespeople on getting a signature and a contract, you're probably going to have a lot of churn. But if you compensate them half when the contract is signed and half when the leading indicator of retention happens, you'll have really good retention. So it's Slack. You get half your money when you sign the customer, and you get the other half when they send their first 2,000 team messages. Guess what's going to happen? The sales rep is going to set them up in a free trial and get them to send 2,000 team messages before they even sign the contract. And you're going to have really good retention. Okay? So just, and then how are we going to measure this? So let's measure this by when the customers were acquired. So let's pretend this is Slack's data, it's not. So this company acquired 24 customers in January, 
And after a month, only 3% had sent those 2,000 team messages. That's not good. After three months, 33% were sending 2,000 team messages a month. After six months, 39%. That is not good. If you're a collaboration software company and less than half of your companies are sending 2,000 team messages a month, that's not good. But they made a lot of changes. Probably, hopefully they changed the comp plan, the onboarding process, the product. And by September, when they signed up 50 customers, two months in, almost 70% of those customers were sending 2,000 team messages a month. That's awesome. So we can look down the, down the column and see our improvement. When I'm like uh, on the board of a seed or series A company, I am so bored in that board meeting until this slide comes up. You're, oh, we acquired this customer, you have this pipeline. Is it working? Show me this first, please. That's, that's the North Star. Cool. All right. So that's the product market fit. Are we ready to scale? So hopefully it's like, okay, product market fit. When should we scale this product? When we have product market fit? Hopefully now we understand how to measure product market fit, not based on a feeling, not based on some other company, but based on our data. And we're all aligned around it. Are we ready to scale now? No. Because at this stage, at product market fit stage, um, Paul Graham, the founder of Y Combinator, famously is quoted saying, do unscalable things early. I think it's perfect for this stage. Um, there's a company called Drift that do the chatbots out of Boston. David Cancel's a good friend. He was the founder. They just sold for a billion dollars in Q4 last year. And um, in the first year of Drift, he, as the founder, CEO, was flying to personally onboard customers that were paying him $50 a month. That's not scalable, but it's brilliant at this stage. It's brilliant. So you have to throw every, you know, there are so many entrepreneurs that come up with an idea. If you can prove that, like, most of your customers see the value that you envisioned, kudos to you. You've accomplished something that like less than 5% of entrepreneurs will ever accomplish in their life. Congratulations. And you need to throw everything in the kitchen sink to make that happen. But at this point, all you've proven is if you put 20 customers into this product this month or this quarter, that most of them are going to succeed. You don't know if you can do that profitably. That's why you're not ready to scale. And so after product market fit, we have to work on go to market fit. And the same way we can quantify product market fit with customer retention, we can quantify go to market fit with unit economics. Why don't we use gap accounting profitability? Because gap accounting profitability doesn't, it doesn't quite measure the scalability of your go to market and the ability to serve your customers. Unit economics tends to isolate better. And just like it's going to take a year for us to understand our customer attention. It takes us a quarter or more to understand our unit economics. So we have to figure out the leading indicators of the unit economics as well. Now, take a big sip of your coffee. I know it's 10, 20. Uh-oh. Here we go. I'm going to, this is a little bit of an easier, a more standard way to conceptualize the leading indicator of unit economics, unlike the leading indicator of retention, but it's algebraic. And so I'm just going to give you an example. Like, um, one of the metrics that like, the SaaS businesses love to measure unit economics is your lifetime value to your cost to customer acquisition ratio, three to one. You might have read about that. So theoretically, when you hire a 27-year-old account executive and they say, what's my job? You kind of say to create an LTV CAC of three. <laughs> but that doesn't mean anything to a 27-year-old account executive. So algebraically, we just have to extract this back into things that they can understand, which is like how many leads they work and the close rate and the average sale price and measure it. So LTV is usually calculated as how much our customers pay us, the annual contract value times the gross margin divided by the churn rate. And the, the cost to acquire customers, how much does it cost to generate demand plus how much does it cost to sell that demand? And the cost for the demand is how much does it cost to generate a lead, sales qualified lead as SQL, divided by the close rate. And the cost to sell it is how much do I pay my reps per month or per quarter and how many customers do they 
sell and how many customers they sell is the close rate on the leads. Sorry I went fast, you, these slides will be posted and you can stare at it, but you get the point. All I did was take this ultimate goal of unit economics and extract it back to something that a 27 year old can understand. Right, and now I can put together a business model. If we sell an average ticket size of $20,000 with a close rate on our leads of 5% and average cost per lead is $1,000, we have a business. And I can dashboard it. As long as the blue line stays above the red, we have go-to-market fit. The red's not gonna happen, no way. But at least we understand our business. Maybe the close rate's a little higher, maybe the ticket size is a little lower, I don't know. But at least we understand quarters ahead of our competitors whether we have a business. So, when are you ready to scale your product? your company, this new product line, or if you're a brand new company, when are you ready to scale? You're ready to scale when you have product market fit and go-to-market fit. And these need to be tackled in sequence. I can't work on go-to-market fit before I have product market fit because I might be optimizing on the wrong product and the wrong market. Yet we work on these together oftentimes. We have to do them in sequence. And I hope this like illustrates a much more data-driven definition based on how your company's now doing, not by some other investor or advisor's experience with another company, okay? All right, the next question, the last one we'll tackle is, now that I have product market fit and go-to-market fit, how fast should I scale? <clears throat> so you're there, you know, like you're, you did it. You show this to an investor, they gave you 10 million bucks in your Series A, they valued at $40 million. And their first question is, can you show me the annual plan for 2022? How fast are you gonna scale? You have 15 people at the company, you have two salespeople, you did a million dollars last year, what are you gonna do in 2022? How do you answer that? So, I'll tell you what I get the answer like 99% of the time. Real true story, San Francisco company, 15 employees, two salespeople, they were doing, they did a million dollars in revenue last, the year before. And I said, what's the plan for 2022? And they said, $9 million. So that's fast. How are you gonna do that? And they said that they had hired 20 salespeople in January. Oh God. <laughs> the sales leaders understand, but you've been pressured into doing that. How did you come up with that? Our salespeople are doing half a million in revenue and that's what the Excel model said. And the, the growth investors told them to do it. Oh my God. And I told them that they're going to have to lay off 20 salespeople a year later, and they did. Because you know, like we, that's fine, the Excel model says that, but like do we have the leads to feed these people? Did anyone note that like half the customers that those two salespeople got were introductions from the board, and that's not gonna scale? Did anyone look at what the average rep to manager ratio is in software is eight to one, so now you need two managers and who are gonna be the managers? Do we even know how many candidates we need to interview to get to 20 good salespeople? Oh my, crazy. So how fast can you scale? It's not about some like Excel model with like the triple, triple, double, double from Silicon Valley and like hiring a ton of salespeople at the beginning of the fiscal year. It's about a pace. Great, congratulations. You have product market fit and you have go-to-market fit. Move into scale mode. How fast should we scale? I don't know. Hire two reps every other month for six months. How about that? Let's try that. Let's hire two reps every other month for six months. And let's watch the lead indicators of attention and the lead indicators of unit economics. That's our speedometer. Like, most people are trying to figure out if they're growing too fast or too slow by doing the quarterly P&L review at the board meeting. The quarterly P&L at the board meeting is what happened nine months ago. 
Like I, I would have a bad quarter, but my board wouldn't know for like two more board meetings. They just weren't on top of it. Your competitors are using the P&L to decide. And if you use the speedometer, that's what's happening today. You're gonna manage your business like six months ahead of your competition. So let's hire two reps every other month and let's see if the speedometer stays green. And if it does, let's hire two reps a month for six months. And if it stays green, let's do four reps a month for six months. And if it stays green, let's do eight reps a month for six months and congrats, you're a unicorn. And you did it in a very data-driven way. It's gonna break. It's going to break, but you're gonna know six months in advance your competition. So you can intervene, fix it, and get back on track. All right, so the last thing we have here is not only does this framework give us a very internally data-driven way on when we're ready to scale and how fast, but it also tells us how to design our go-to-market system based on the phase that we're in, because it changes. The first rep you hire is way different than the 10th rep you hire. I made this mistake. The 10th rep is like, give me the playbook, give me my territory, give me my commission plan, and let me go make a lot of money and make you a lot of money. Love it, coin operated rep. That's a terrible first rep, terrible. You're, you're in the product market fit phase, you don't have it right yet. That person's gonna come in and pitch 20 customers, they're gonna say no and they say this thing's not working. You need like a half product manager, half account executive. You need someone that's gonna go out there, I mean a huge hire, this is the first person in your company that's gonna talk to 30 customers a week. That's super valuable. But they need to have the ability to take a step back and pattern recognize what they're seeing and then communicate it to the engineering team. That's a good first hire. These are people who are like, they're not, yeah, they want to make money, but like they don't really want to optimize it. They might not need a commission plan at the first phase. They love dramatic change. They want to be there early building things. They're out there. You often find them like in your local city, go find like a Series B or Series Key C company that's succeeding now. It's scaling. These people hate their life right now. They're in the factory. They don't belong in the factory. That's where you find them. First couple reps at that company. They, that's who they are. And like at this stage, don't talk to me about the, like, don't talk to me about your cold calling strategy, your pricing model, your comp model, it doesn't matter. We're just trying to get like 30 customers or so to like see if we can get product market fit. But that all changes at the go-to-market fit phase. We need a playbook. We need a team to build the playbook. We definitely need one scalable demand gen channel like content marketing or, demand or uh, cold calling. And we need to get our pricing and our compensation model right. Don't talk to me about those things during product market fit, I don't care. I just care about that chart with the cohorts. But at this point, this is when we have to get this right. We can't add 20 reps this year without a scalable demand gen channel. And then a different set comes up with growth and mo. okay? So hopefully that gives you a little bit of color if you're bringing a new product to market. Even if you're going into a new market, I think you gotta use this channel. You gotta use these frameworks. And so just the, um, before I go, I'll do two, um, two things is, uh, as Paul mentioned, um, for stage two capital, we're the first VC firm that's run and backed by, um, let me just see where I at here. We're the first VC firm run and backed by CROs and CMOs. So we have 300 CROs and CMOs as our backers of all, pretty much all the, the public company software companies, you know, so Salesforce, SAP, Zoom, Asana, Alassian. Um, and we help companies, usually when they're around a million in revenue, to figure out their go-to-market. Um, we, we did introduce a sales, accelerate, um, a, uh, sales accelerator this month that we're uh, taking applications for. So if you're in like the tens of thousands or hundred of thousands, you can go to Stage 2 Capital and click on Accelerator. We're taking apps. And then um, Paul mentioned my book. I wrote it after the HubSpot days about using, different than the stuff we talked about today, but like how to use a very data-driven um, approach to building a sales team. You can check that out, it's, it's for sale out there. I'm doing a book sign at 4.30. I do wanna note that 100% of the proceeds are donated to build.org. Is anyone in, um, involved in build.org? Um, this is an organization that, um, they're, they're in like 27 cities. They partner with the three worst high schools in the city, like Gaines and all this 
drug use and that kind of stuff. And they introduce them to entrepreneurship when they're a freshman and with the intent to get them through high school and into college. And they have been able to get 99% of their kids through high school and 88% into college, which is way higher than what those high schools are doing. So if you do support the book, note that you're supporting build.org and I thank you very much. Take care.